What's up, everybody? Welcome to Omnic Lab. We're a podcast that focuses on the strategies in the game of Overwatch. We learn through trial and error in a lab-like format with scientific method. Sometimes things get a little crazy and blow up in our faces in those beakers because we're trying out stuff we're learning from other folks as well as things we're trying to teach ourselves just through playing the game. So I'm your host, Rob May, on episode 84 of the Omnic Lab. This week, we're mixing things up. This is the 2017 final show of the year, and this time we've kicked it back to our community to give us some community lessons that they've learned either from the show or through playing the game throughout this last year, and they wanted to contribute. So we will be giving them proper uh, contributions, and we'll just be gracing you with their tips using our voices and our, meaning that there is another person here with me. This is my co-host and yours, Andres Gomez, all the way from Georgia. What's up? Andres. What's up? What's up? Yeah, I've been super excited for this episode. This is probably my one of my favorite episodes from the year because we actually turn things around and we actually get to hear from you guys what you've learned from the show, like you said, Rob, or what you've learned just playing the game um, this whole entire year. So uh, it's it's a really nice episode because normally you guys get to listen to us telling you all these tips and stuff, and now we get to listen to you tell us all these good tips. Absolutely. This is also one of my favorite shows of the year, um, especially, I mean, I would have said that this is always my favorite episode of the year, except that we actually got to go to BlizzCon for the first time, and that was that's pretty hard to beat, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, this, this week we're going to basically just cover very quickly, there's like no news, except for Season 8 is out, and... Um, well, it's not out as of the recording of the live show right now, but by the time you're getting this on January 1st, it is ready to roll. You guys can be playing a new comp season eight. Get ready to get out there and keep continuing to push for that next skill tier or those next few SR points. And then we'll get into the community lessons. So the next thing here on the docket as far as news update is the game night we had on the 29th of December was glorious. We oh, had so good. I have, I think this was honestly, like, during this particular break has almost always consistently been the best game and I have the year to make. And uh, I hate it when I have to say stuff like that and there's so many people that contact you. They're like, oh, I missed it again. No. But um, <laughs> it happens. I mean, there's lots of, I even got a message just today from somebody who says, I have literally missed every single game night since I started listening. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like. I'm sorry, dude. I can't help it. Well, just so um, everyone who's listening knows, the game nights usually happen the last Friday of Friday. every month. So ju just try to look for the last Friday of every month. The, the date will vary. But if it's the last Friday, there will probably be a game night from Omnic Lab happening. So just mark it in your calendars already if you know that's going on. But I totally agree with you. This game night for this month was super, super awesome. I think we had a lot of folks that were hanging out at home with their families for Christmas and just hanging out, playing Overwatch with us. We played for so long. I think people started organizing themselves around like 4 or 5 Eastern. And yeah. I, I came around Five like Eastern was the official start time. And it went until I can't even remember how long it went in my game. Oof, night, I was still going after you. Went very to bed. long, yeah, very long, because I was there until like three my time or something like that. We were three in the oh, morning. It was my at time. least three more hours after you went to bed. We were oh, still wow. Going. Wow. <laughs> it was like six in the morning Eastern. So that is a very that's a 12, uh, 13 hour game night. I think. Yeah, that was pretty long. We had at one point like three full lobbies of people just playing six versus six. Just for PC. Yeah, it was it was really fun. And honestly, it it gets it let us get to know you guys. And it's a great place for us to chat with you guys. And everyone's very, very jokey, very lighthearted. We get people doing like weird robot noises over Discord. And sometimes it does get a little hectic and it's hard to control. But honestly, that's kind of part of the fun. Um the and one charm of, things, of it. Yeah, one of the things I've been loving is that the more that we do them, it's kind of becoming kind of like, um, I, I don't want to say tradition, but it's like a more established event. So a lot of the people kind of like are starting to know the etiquette and they kind of like know the drill. 
Things are moving faster. We have a lot of right. community members that make it very smooth. Special thanks to Icy Sorrow, uh, Shockmaster, uh, all the guys that helped helped us organize the the whole entire thing. Because you guys are the the true heroes, putting on the lobbies and getting everyone in line, picking the captains, all that stuff. Thank you so much for putting in the time. You guys made this game night super smooth and super fun for everyone. I had a blast getting killed and killing you guys too. <laughs> and also special thanks to Xcalper and Abnerd for continually promoting our Xbox community. I also know I want to shout out Lamb Burglar mm -hmm. and Queen of Salt and um, Walrus for holding the fort, holding the door over there with the Xboxers. And then we had um, Capricious Fate and CS for our playstation 4 they said that at some points they had an entire full six on six game night for one of the few times that actually happens it's it was amazing nice. so I, I was really glad to see them really enjoying the playstation 4 side of things and they were doing amazing work yeah so it's, it's not just pc or uh yeah not just pc we also do ps4 and xbox and we got those guys over there trying to organize i wish i could jump on the consoles uh a little more often but honestly yeah i think i would just rage quit after the first game where i can't kill <laughs> anyone <laughs> can't shoot anything with that mccree yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, anyways, I uh, I wanted to transition us out of this topic in particular because we will try to make these. We're trying to. Anders and I were talking before we started recording. This is going to be something that we've kind of just developed into a regular thing, and we want to make sure that we're a little bit more dedicated to making it happen, so that at least one of us is going to try to be present at these game nights consistently because we love them that much. It's just a good touch point with you guys. Um, there are a few times that. Andres and I couldn't make it, and we made community things that month for them to set up the game nights. But that's totally fine. You guys can organize those whenever you want, but we want to try to make sure that we can make those as best we can, even when life gets busy. We want to try to make that a priority for us. Yeah, we even do love though, those game uh, nights. Yeah, so we, uh, we did get a main question from this about podcasting apps. I, I got talked with some people that switched um, transitions here. So the big thing was they were asking about Spotify and I filled out the form and Andres and I talked in the pre-show. We're, we're cooking up some stuff in the back end. We're trying to get it into Spotify. Uh, it's kind of out of our hands right now, but we are maybe working on a solution to kind of just get in soon. But if you are struggling to find a way um, when you're transitioning from Apple to Android, or if you're on Android and you're not really happy with your service, please go check out Overcast for a free app solution. And my favorite personal app is called Pocket Cast. I use that for all of my podcasts, and it does have a little bit of a 2 to $3 fee, but there are so many hidden features that are amazing in the app. You can trim silence. You can volume boost. You can increase the speed for these two-hour podcasts that you might be listening to before us, <laughs> and they are amazing. And we're on... Every platform, except for Spotify, apparently, we're on every platform, and Pocket Cast is the one you want to go find, and it's got a great system. It's very, very similar to iTunes, and it's just great. And so I wanted to make sure I highlighted that for those of you that are transitioning to or from iPhones. Yeah, absolutely. And we are working on getting on Spotify as soon as we can for those of you who want to listen to us over there. And Andres, why don't you let people know about the recap as a steady reminder? where yeah. they can find it and what it is. Absolutely. For those of you who are interested in the Overwatch League, where well, that's about to start in about 10 days from today, um, the OWL recap or new show covering the Overwatch League, the matches, results, uh, players, interviews, all that stuff has its own home right now. If you go to the iTunes stores or to Pocket Cast, like Rob said, and you look up <clears throat> OWL recap or the Overwatch League recap, you should find our show. And um, if you're interested in that, please give us a follow. We have a couple interviews over there already with Numlocked and Cuddles from LA Valiant. And we also got an interview with Coach Elliot Hayes from Philadelphia Fusion. Really cool guys, really interesting stuff. So if you're into that, please check it out. Let us know what you think. And we'll be looking forward to recapping all that starting January 10th. And finally here, we have to shout out our, our good friend and partner, Switch, or the Switch Fox. 
uh, over there at Omnic Meta. Um, he is on hiatus for holidays, um, traveling with family to go see them in the Philippines. If you're wondering, where's the Meta? Uh, but also, it's a good time when it's in the off season, so you can wait probably a week, and then he'll be back at it, giving you some more Meta updates for console and PC for Season 8. So keep on that and keep refreshing those F5 keys for his website. But without further ado, we're going to go into the community lessons, what our community had submitted to us. And um, I wrote down a few, and Andres is probably going to have a few at the end as well um, for just tips that we've been learning this last season. But let's kick it off. Um, Andres, why don't you take it from your other co-host and our Hauser at uh, BlizzCon, Justin. All right. The first community lesson comes from Justin, a.k.a. Aidmaro. He says, my biggest learning experience this year has been control of emotions and the ability to realize when things aren't working. These, I feel, are some of the most intangibles that take time in Overwatch. I played since the beta, and up until six or seven months ago, I had no idea of, some of, the, of the depth of some of these aspects of the game. There are things that you can always can continue to learn from. Last big tip, review VODs. Even though it doesn't seem impactful, try to find someone to help you review VODs for you or with you. Wawa's Bootcamp is a huge free resource for this. Looking back at it, I could have probably pushed back into Diamond this season if I would have done so. And I tend to agree. Reviewing your own bots, even you don't even have to send it to somebody else. I know it can be sometimes boring and daunting, but if you can record a few of your games where you're trying to play to your full capability, and then after you take a break at night, brew some coffee or make some tea, make some G Fuel, I don't know. I don't know, whatever it is that you like drinking. <laughs> Sit down and just watch yourself. Honestly, once you start watching yourself, you notice so many little mistakes that you're doing that you're like, oh my God, what? why am I doing that? And just the act of watching yourself and going through like the mental process of like dissecting your own gameplay will improve you because next time you're playing, your brain will ha have established like those connections, if that makes any sense. So reviewing your own bots, very, very useful to improving. And yes, sending it to somebody else, because sometimes we are biased. And when we, when we watch our own VODs, we might still be thinking that maybe it was somebody else's fault, like your teammate or something. But sometimes it takes somebody else to watch a VOD to tell you, hey, even though what you're doing is not terrible, you could be doing this instead, which might be a lot more effective and point you in a perspective that you hadn't thought about before. You uh, got anything to add to this one? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to harp on the shout out to Wawa's. I've benefited from them. And if you guys are looking for a support coach, uh, shout out to Fu. He's your guy. He's going to also, he's, he told me if I needed some more help with transitioning with Moira, I can, I can contact him. And of course, Shockmaster in the Discord is always available for Moira tips and Zen tips. Um, but Wawa's is a great free coaching resource. Please Google it. It is a great thing. I'm going to try to see if we can reach out and uh, Wawa's is also the same people that are helping out with Blaze and Bob of uh, the Owl Recap. He's he's also on um, another show with Ja from Watchpoint Radio, which sneak preview, I will be on Watchpoint this week um, coming up, but um, they're, they have another show called Prepare to Attack and they pull all of their resources from Wawa coaches for teaching um, on their show for their hero guides so if you want to hear it more from a coaching aspect instead of from a hero mastery aspect which is kind of a little bit of overlap i guess you could say is kind of our style but it's it's a it feels very different um in in uh, how they approach it and it's just another good way to go learn but let's get into the next one this one comes from geo ca says i've learned quite a bit from omnic lab this year coming from console to pc was hard but these guys gave me the information to help me make the switch comfortably I learned about the technical stuff like DPI and sensitivity. The hero guides were uh, where there are no clear favorite episodes due to them all being good. Uh, and strategies from the hero guides and random strategy podcasts. You guys are doing great service to all the people like me who want to be serious when it comes to competitive or always keep up doing what you're doing. Well, thank you so much. Um, the, the big thing, again, the big takeaway here is... Uh, just making sure you're realizing that technical play uh, has a, a little bit of an overlap with Hero Mastery and the Hero Guides. I couldn't agree more. Very nice. Let's go to the next one from Kawai Gengu. 
And I want to give this guy a little shout out because he actually is the artist. Kawaii. Kawaii. It means cute in Japanese. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank you. Kawaii Kengu. Um, he drew my little avatar on Discord right now. It's an Omnic McCree, and it looks <laughs> super, super cool. He's super young. He's only 14, but he's super talented. And um, thank you. Thank you for drawing that little McCree for me. He says, I have learned the importance of high ground angles, old economy, and staying alive. Very, very important concepts in Overwatch. Will make you live a lot longer and will make you kill a lot more. He's also working on a Moira for me, so I'm super excited. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up here is Never Clutch. He has two tips. Says, the importance of working around your tanks is what I've learned. I've always been a person to be flexible, but I really like the idea of the team comp should be based around your tanks. Then you work together for a cohesive unit. Helps my picks a ton now. Yeah, that was one thing that we highlighted the last show in particular. We have a lot of things that we had really, really big, good feedback on our last show. Um, and this is one of the first hints. The next thing, the import, it's also the important, I've also learned the importance to know if the other team is playing your hero better than you. It may be best to switch your hero. If you're playing a Ryan v. Ryan and the enemy Reinhardt just keeps winning that barrier fight against you, you're probably better off playing another hero. It goes along the lines of the MOBA play and the quote unquote counters to heroes. Yeah, this is this is actually a good point to make. There are times where you will get outplayed. That's just plain and simple. There are times where you will maybe fill on Reinhardt. Maybe he's not your main guy, and you go up up against the person that has three hundred hours on Reinhardt. Like it just it doesn't matter if you have good game sense or not. Like this person is gonna have more muscle memory built in. He's gonna have he's gonna be able to to tell like those little nuances that give things away that can make you have an edge over the enemy Reinhardt just because he's mm -hmm. played it so much. Um, and sometimes the best course of action is instead of trying to pull your hairs out um, and and ask yourself, why can't I beat this Reinhardt? Maybe just switch it up, you know, get a diva, get get behind him, um, make him, get him out of his comfort zone, try something new. Yeah, for sure. The, the other thing too about this is you have to remember when... Also, when you're losing the 1v1s and they keep winning, when not to switch, it's just as important of a decision. Mm -hmm. Because your, your, your hero pick may be weaker than their hero pick in that 1v1, but Overwatch is not 1v1. So you got to keep that in mind. All right, next one. All right, next one comes from Baya Shrimp, one of her mods in the Discord channel. I have learned to improve my game awareness by observing the playstyles of the enemy's carrying heroes. It's good training to foresee their next steps and to ruin their strategy. I made it a habit to always look for the sneaky Reaper or McCree and have a spamming Junkrat eliminated who had been doing massive damage from the high ground. I think this is really important. Um, just thinking about the enemy threats, thinking about the enemy team and what are the guys that are going to come and kill you. And not only that, but how are they going to come and kill you? Normally, just looking at the heroes, you generally tend to have an idea of what they're trying to do, right? Like if they have a Genji or a Tracer, it's very likely they're going to flank you. Reapers kind of tend to do that too. McCrees and Soldiers are going to try and engage you more, you know, from the safety of their shields or high ground. So you kind of have an idea. And just keeping this in mind and as you're moving up into the point or as you're moving into the danger zone, just kind of like thinking about, hmm, where, where do you think I can get jumped from? And sometimes you can pre-firing or pushing like certain areas that that you wouldn't normally push, uh, just because mm -hmm. you might think somebody's hiding in there can like really clutch out some moments. She also says in solo queue, I've also learned to mute toxic players or to to turn off voice chat completely when communications turn into a catastrophe. Save your sanity and have some peace and quiet to focus on the game and having your spirits ruined by a holes. <laughs> And this, honestly, this is, great. is this is just common sense, right? Like sometimes yeah. some debauchery will happen in chat and there's just nothing you can do. And sometimes better than joining into the debauchery and screaming at each other and, and being not, not very polite, um, just turn off those people or get out of the team chat yourself. Like if people are being yeah. so toxic in the team chat that you can't even like make calls or discuss strategy, um, then there's not really a point in being there anymore. 
is it? Mm. Yeah. Let's keep going. Uh, we got next up, we got Blazing Bob, which we mentioned at the top of the show here. And says, geez, I could write an essay on what I've learned from the show over the past year. Possibly the biggest thing I've learned was to keep relearning. When listening to the show, I often find myself saying, dude, I already know that, but I just forgot it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still continually and constantly learning new things from the lab, but I don't. But I really loved that reiteration episodes that we had did um, not that far back. It helped me review and remember a lot of the things that I've learned from you guys but had forgotten. And the second, Overwatch mental game is kind of like golf for me. I just had to keep reminding myself of all of the tips over and over until it becomes second nature. And on the flip side, it becomes a little bit more like martial arts in the sense that you have to do the same good habits over and over in, or in movements in order to improve muscle memory so that when the time comes, you can do the physical actions and the mechanics automatically. Exactly. You can go this into is, ultra instinct. This is, this is really, really good uh, tips. And his first tip is actually one of the ones that I wrote down at the end. And I'll, I'll spin my own take on this later so <laughs> um sure, let's go I to the next one Anders. i always just want to rate here in the on the muscle memory that is just so important in overwatch i don't think people sometimes realize it uh internalizing oh, certain sure. movements and not just like a little practice like we are talking about like deep internalizing sometimes when you look at some of the pro players some of the craziest moves that they do are almost a secondhand reaction from them. Like they, they don't necessarily like think about them, but they've done these moves so many times that their hand basically just, just kind of moves once the situation arises. Um, a good example of this is like the top McCree's. Sometimes you'll see him play against a Genji or a Tracer. And the second that um, Genji or a Tracer dash or blink behind them they just do an 180 turn and i i've seen them headshot these players without even flashbanging the first like literally just muscle memory 180 they're 180 not, they're not even looking yep. like they're not even trying to find the person they just know the general location that they're in the they trajectory can see, of the they blink can, yeah they can also see the trace of the blink or the or the dash and just muscle memory turn around and kill and like it's so important, especially in a game like Overwatch, where you have microseconds to react, like eliminating as much lag between what you see and when you react. It's super important. All right, Anders, let's get into the next one here. Next one comes from Nerf Fanatic. I just transitioned from Destiny to Overwatch. Oh, geez. <laughs> Good luck with the sensitivity. We were talking about this Me too. With Robin <laughs> the other day. Like, oof, every time we play Destiny, our sensitivity gets thrown off the window. Or, or yep. muscle memory, I mean. Just yep. transitioned from Destiny to Overwatch, and Omnic Lab, Omnic Lab has taught me a ton. The biggest thing is probably teaching me how to Overwatch isn't really a shooter. It is, but it isn't. You know, you're right. As, as you guys described it in the show, it's a MOBA with the execution of a shooter. Oh, that's a very good description. This really helped me realize... We did. I, yeah. <laughs> this really <laughs> helped me realize I was going to have the approach to the game completely differently from, this, from Destiny, where I just run and frag out, oh, yeah, that's one of the worst things you can do over here. Or sometimes yeah. I see people not respect their enemy. Like, they'll be out there frag, like shooting at their enemy in a point where their enemy can easily shoot at them and it's like you know this is not destiny where mm. you can like run away very easily like mm -hmm. you have 200 hp and like these guys can do like 300 damage in like two seconds and you can't recharge your health <laughs> yeah and you can't recharge your health you're relying on your healer to do that to, for you exactly mm. but uh he also says um i have to wait for my teammates coordinate pushes etc another thing i learned is that i have to accept where i'm at terms of skill level just acknowledging that there is not always my teammates' fault Help me climb from high silver to mid gold in just the last two weeks of the season. Thanks for giving me and everyone else in here something to look forward to each week. Oh, thank you. That is very nice of you. We look forward to it too, bringing you guys the show and trying to um, discover this game as much as we can. And that's really cool that that's what you learn. Honestly, that's a um, very humble attitude that you have there. Hmm. Let's keep it going. Uh, we got a lot of tips here, and we're already at the 25-minute mark, so I want to make sure we get it to all of you. We got Queen Assault coming up next from Xbox and also sl slowly transitioning to PC. Uh, oh, boy, what have I not learned this year? I got Overwatch a little over a year ago, and I went 
expecting a much worse to be much worse at this game than I am. But I guess one thing I have learned specifically from the lab is that there's always more room to improve. I learned so many little technical things specific to Mercy that now improve my confidence with her that no matter the circumstance, um, I can still play. And that's a pretty big deal for me. I've also learned just how unique this game is from other shooters coming from, yet again, Destiny, in which I could eliminate three, a three-man team if I was good enough. And that wasn't really the deal or the thing in Overwatch. So trusting in my teammates has been a huge task for me this year. I'd like to thank slash blame the community with Omnic Lab for that task. <laughs> They've also <laughs> helped me loads with the mentality aspect of the game, a place I've always struggled by making sure that I remember to have fun even when the circumstances feel like they're at their worst. I stop rambling here just to make sure to thank you all for making me feel like I'm a part of the Overwatch community, even though I've not been here since the beginning. These are some very kind words coming from somebody who is extremely active in the community um, of our show in particular. Um, <laughs> if you guys know anything about the Discord, if you see a yellow tag, those are the people that talk the most. <laughs> um, for some of you, that's the people that you want to avoid, and for others, those are the ones you want to go talk to. So uh, each their own. But, um, uh, yeah, I, I can relate with a lot of the, the mentality things. It's something that I'm continually relearning, um, especially when I review my VODs. You can see the chats or you can hear yourself speaking. And you're like, dang, I am toxic in this game. <laughs> Stuff like that happens a lot. Um, and th I feel like man. this game gets the the best of you. It, it's unavoidable, oh, yeah. right? Even the chillest people. I am a very chill person and it's very Until hard to Roadhog get me mad. Shows up. I've gotten very mad playing this game. So I've been there, guys. We, we all know how it feels. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, you also have to realize that it is a game and that, you know, this this doesn't define who you are. And sometimes having a more positive attitude, wanting to work with your teammates and be more focused on how you can improve, it's a lot easier on your own sanity for your own sake and for your own enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> All let's right, we got to, one uh, of the coolest names for our next member here. Let's go to Sapdosekis or Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Pokemon I got, and, and beer. Yeah. I got Overwatch two months ago, so I'm still pretty new, but listening to Omnic Lab gave me a leg up. I suppose the biggest thing I've learned as a new player both through Omnic Lab and continued practice is situational awareness. It sounds so obvious, but avoiding a diva bomb is so much easier if you take a second to look around and see what you what cover you can get behind before you jump into the fight. I didn't really grasp this at first. I would often just accept that I was going to die if I ever heard nerf this. <laughs> but not anymore. Awesome. So yeah, gotta continue to practice and listen and hopefully improve my game for next season. I think situational awareness is an ongoing skill that... It's not like you just get it one day and you're good to go. It's a skill that continues to increase through your entire career. Even the top of the top Overwatch League players right now, they are still improving their awareness. Granted that they can dissect a lot of information coming at them. They're really good at telling what's going on. They can orient themselves by sound, by their own teammates, by callouts, by just sheer looking at the map and seeing what other heroes are playing. Like they, they have a lot of knowledge that can cover this. But Overwatch sometimes can be a cluster jam of like all these things. Um, so no matter what level you're at, you can improve your awareness. And the more that you improve it, the more little details you can exploit. You want to add anything here? Or you might want to next one. Yes, absolutely. Um, on on this point in particular, I I can totally get on base with this. Like getting to the point where your situational awareness is not something that is perceived, but I think Andres, you said something about per situational awareness, even just like last month or this month, where you're talking about developing the sixth sense or the developing the spidey senses of yeah. when things are coming into yeah. your perception memory as like a predicting essence that's something that is beyond the level of um intermediate like that is your ticket to diamond as far as i'm concerned like once you've started learning the game you learn your hero 
uh, that you like playing, you know, your little skill sets are there, your positioning's improved. Once you're there, then it's all developmental of your spidey senses of Overwatch. <laughs> so that's a good point that she brings up here. But let's Absolutely. keep going. I'm going to go to take my man, Chipmunk. 2353 we actually had the pleasure of meeting him at blizzcon um like the day before because he didn't get to pick up a ticket but he did come drive down and, and say hey to us which is great he says oh boy what to say outside the home this place has become i think that the biggest part is the mental game and trying to go in with a mentality of having fun and learning i'm super competitive and this has been very difficult for me also the small tips for heroes that i'm trying to learn has been very helpful and the community has been encouraging and pushing me forward along with the advice has been amazing and i'm gonna piggyback off of this too this is a topic that doesn't really get talked a lot and andres and i like really want to do full shows on this but we feel like it's it's something that needs to be just constant you know in every show and we don't really do a great job at making maintaining mental game as a key aspect and we try to bring that in every one of the hero guides in particular especially when we have people on the show that get the bad rap for being one tricks and um, top 500 ladder warriors rather than, you know, pro players, if that makes sense. Because mm-hmm. um, those guys get the brunt of everything. Like the, they're like little Hanzo main, you know, every time. These are the guys that hit the mute button more than anyone else in, in the ladder. <laughs> you know what I mean? They got a key And uh, I had a, right, right, right. They have it on key bind. <laughs> um, but I, I talked about this actually in my Hearthstone podcast about when I was really struggling with the game not in any other sense other than a personal like i came to to terms by saying i'm not enjoying hearthstone because when i play the game if i i am dictating the ability of enjoyment out of a game by if i win or not and that is not a good place to be in to enjoy a game you cannot enjoy the game anymore and in so much that you enjoy winning because then you just enjoy winning and um, if you if you play Overwatch, you play soccer. If you play pick up Monopoly, like <laughs> you're not going to enjoy the game unless you're winning. Oh my god, that sounds like a terrible time. Dude, they're vicious. <laughs> 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 or um, you ever you, you know the guy in your in your family reunion? You have to get playing uh, board games, and the guy always wants to play Catan, and then rage quits after ten <laughs> minutes in because he can't get sheep trades. You know, it's the same thing. <laughs> but it it is true. It is true. It's like a small change of mentality. But if you're playing mm-hmm. the game to win and you don't win, you go on a losing streak, you're going to be very disappointed and the game is not going to ever live to your expectations. In a game like Overwatch, where we all have bad days, that is that is an unhealthy mentality to have. I think it's easier on yourself and other people as well because, you know, you you will be less toxic and hopefully everyone will be less toxic. But if you go into the game with the mindset of learning, because unless you're in a pro tournament playing with a full six stack, the games don't really matter that much, right? Like your SR is just <laughs> is just a number. You're part of like 30 yeah. other million players that are playing this game. It's it's not a big deal. But if you go in with the mentality that you just want to learn, want to improve at your hero, even if you lose, you might have played really well. So you come out of that game thinking, oh, man, that was a great game. Even though you lost the match, it was like, oh, I had a great game to game. I've never gotten a quintuple kill with my blade. That was awesome kind of thing. All right, next along, Andres, you're up. All right, next one comes from Shazir. The Going Deep episodes have done more to help me improve my game, both with and against the heroes used than hours of watching YouTube vids and being a better at X. The test noobs help me go from 900 SR to the point of brushing plat 2432 SR season high. Listening to the podcast on my commute helps me keep the joy of Overwatch even when I'm sitting in traffic. (laughs) I can totally relate to that, Shazir, because I love listening to gaming podcasts when I'm um, riding in my car as well. It keeps me kind of like in tune with the community. It helps me feel part of like, I'm, I'm still part of the game, even though I'm not necessarily playing at the time. So I know the feeling. And that's awesome that you've improved so much. Um, I think that sometimes being able to listen to some content in a different environment, like podcasts are audio. So like you said, you can listen to them in your car or in places where you normally 
couldn't watch a video or stuff. So I think that because of this, podcasts have like this nice ability of be able to like communicate certain things at a more personal level, if that makes sense. Like usually people listen to podcasts while they're doing kind of like mind, mindless tasks at home or they're going for a, wa- a walk or they're at work, uh, they have some spare time. So I, I feel like it's a more introspective time when you listen to podcasts. I don't know if that's just me. Maybe I'm getting too philosophical over here. <laughs> Maybe, but the world may never know, Andres. <laughs> Let's get on to the next one. Next one. Uh, we got Walrus coming in from the Xbox crew. I'm glad that I get to read this one because they referenced me. So he says, what I learned this year is plain and simple. And I'm paraphrasing Rob a bit, but to play better, you need to play more. Um, sounds simple enough and it is simple even if just playing more quick play and arcade my mechanics are improving next step is to take what i've learned into ranked play uh and ps i also learned that i should just stick to tanks i'm not a dps player (laughs) (laughs) but yeah i had a i don't remember when it was that i talked with walrus but i had a i had a really slow day at the office and popped my head over to their uh xbox chat and he was feeling really depressed with some of his stuff in ranked and just not having any progress. And he's like, I'm just doing all the things and I'm not getting there. And I'm asking him like, you know, not, not, I'm not giving away his rank, but I'm just saying like, Walrus, are you, are you playing at least 10 games a week? I was like, I know you have kids and uh, he's, he's been working really hard on the game and he loves his family. He does so much stuff with his family. Like you, I, couldn't even believe all the community stuff that he does just around his small little circle of family mm-hmm. like the guy's really really dedicated to pretty much anything he touches and um he's like frankly i i can't seem to put more than like five games a week on the weekends and i'm like there's your issue buddy you can you can listen to any content you can watch every pro game you can even uh donate money to your favorite podcast <laughs> but it's not going to get you anywhere <laughs> if you don't play the game and frankly, if you're not playing the game enough, you can't get there. And that was my issue. You can't you can't improve and climb to platinum if you're playing, or if you can't you can't climb to diamond, Rob, if you're playing Destiny. Yeah, <laughs> it just you just can't do it because you're not playing the game. I've uh, I've always said it, but playing Overwatch is like playing an instrument. You just have to practice, and if you don't practice, you're just not going to improve. Also, if you improve and then you stop practicing, you actually like decrease you, your skill goes noticeably down or a good example is like going to the gym if you have a really good routine you're doing great and then you stop flat out for a month and then you try, try to come back to that routine that you were doing and good luck you're probably not even <laughs> going to like get near completing it because you're mm-hmm. you're like not conditioned anymore and it's the same thing with overwatch you gotta keep your muscles sharp the more that you're playing the more that they're like taking it in and the more that they're used to like doing those movements um and i can even tell from one day to the next like if i play a ton of overwatch one day and then stop for one day and then come back i can tell that i'm worse a little worse again and it takes me a second to Mm kind of like get back into my groove the Mm -hmm. the weeks that i've done the best and the times that i've climbed the most all the way up to masters have been the weeks where i've been playing every day a significant amount of time i'm talking about at least like four or five matches a day kind of thing so that every day kind of like my muscles my muscle memory is really fresh i'm kind of like in the mindset i'm thinking about the game i'm thinking about how to improve myself um i've been maybe playing a couple of heroes like a lot that week and i'm just in my groove kind of thing and sometimes that takes like a couple days to for it to happen um yeah. What 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 about you guys? Do you guys feel the same way? I'm kind of I'm kind of curious to hear from you guys. Yeah, I'm guys... pretty curious about this too. But I I kind of took a lot of like Andres. We take a lot of our influence from how we improved in Hearthstone. I mean, that's that's a lot of it right there because it's just repetitions and trying the deck and playing things and putting your eyes in different scenarios strategically mm-hmm. and like thinking in different ways in order to master something. But I think it's just that way with everything. You know, it's not just working out. It's not just playing Overwatch. It's just like. It's almost always, almost, again, almost and always together. It's kind of a catch-22, but almost always better to play two games a day than to play 10 games in a sitting. Like, it's just generally going to be a better practice because you're getting consistency over the course of time rather than playing things in bursts. 
I mean, if Overwatch was a, a sprint that you could prep for, then that might work. But yeah. Overwatch is more of a dedicated season for those of you that are not in Overwatch League. And even the ones in Overwatch League are the ones, the guys that go in, play the game all morning for their job, and then in the evening they stream it and they just play it for fun. <laughs> so they're, they're just playing, continually playing the same thing <laughs> with different goals, you know? No, but seriously, if you're right. like if you're serious about your climb, I would take it kind of like if you're like going to the gym, like set up a routine, like at least two hours, hopefully a little bit more. Three hours would be a little more ideal. But I know that's not like <clears throat> in everyone's po like capability. Like you, some of you have full time jobs, some of you have family, some of you have both, some of you are like doing master's degrees in the university. So time hopefully. is you yeah, have both. time is scarce. <laughs> um, but just know that maybe if you have like a week coming up where you know that you're going to have like a slow week, there's not going to be a lot going on. Maybe set yourself mm. up a schedule. Be like, I'm going to play from four to six every day, Overwatch, just straight up comp, maybe log in like 15 minutes earlier and warm up a little bit and be very serious about it. Um, don't worry too much about the rank, but more about playing very mindfully and playing constantly for a few days. Mm. And you'll notice that by the end of that week, it's like a well-oiled machine. You, your body is just going to be moving like how you want it to move. I'm going to take a crack at this name, Andres, because I know you don't want to. So it, Please I do. think this is a Chinese name. Um, Yang Xiaolong. Go ahead. Yang Xiaolong. How, how is that? Sounds good. Okay, good. <laughs> but it's your turn to read, so All I'm right. going to give it to you. <laughs> Having only owned the game since September, th this podcast really helped me learn that not every hero is played the same way. Some might think this is very obvious, but I've never played FPS games before, and this really helped me. The Going Deep episode specifically. And um, yeah, that is very true. Awesome. Every hero in this game is very unique, and you have to play him very differently. It's not like a Call of Duty or... Uh, even even Destiny is a little more homogenous in like your your characters and stuff. Overwatch has a lot of variety. Like you got Doomfist, and then you also have Widowmaker. Like completely opposite. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take the next one. Key Lime Kangaroo Omnic Labs has taught me a lot this year. I got the game the last couple days of the Uprising event. Um, when I started with absolutely no understanding of the game, what a MOBA even was. I've actually never been much of a gamer so for example i learned what a nerf and a buff were what hit scan meant simple things but also i learned the importance of looking at your own gameplay and improving from there the game is all about recognizing your own mistakes and punishing others mistakes also i learned what a huge community esports and gaming have so thanks for the awesome year oh and also i learned about the may double headshot combo seems obvious now but it really wasn't before I heard it. Little tricks like that are awesome. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Love I've, hearing new new players stuff like this. I've it's actually great. met a lot of new players like that. Uh, now that he writes this, like a lot of players that have a game casually, but through the podcast, they've kind of like <clears throat> we've been kind of like a gateway into the gaming community kind of thing, where they hear about the Discord and they're like, "Oh, what what is a Discord?" and then. We invite them in and they're like, oh, wow, like all these people are here. And then they they can reach out to other people. And um, it's happened to a couple of people that have like come and talk to me and like basically ask me questions about the gaming community. And um, for Rob and for me and for a lot of you that are already here and listen to the show, this is already obvious, right? Especially if you are coming from PC, sure. you're used to the times of... Uh, forums and reddit and the ventrilo coming into discord like all those little things so you're kind of like already in that community but there's there's a lot of people that are just joining like video games are getting super big this past few years and you have all these people that have never been part of the community that are just now discovering how how big this really mm -hmm. is so i i love I love when some of you guys kind of like make the leap and discover this whole new world because it's a it's a very cool world. I remember the first time I learned what hit scan wants. I could probably even tell you where I was at. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably behind Anders's McCree, to be honest. <laughs> this is why, what hit scan means. Why is he hitting me so fast? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I actually didn't know what hit scan meant until I started playing Overwatch. So, 
That's some yeah. some good stuff right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. All right, Andres, kick us off with our patron, Great Root Bear. Great Root Bear says, I learned that I really like using Winston, even though I'm terrible with him. <laughs> Serious, <laughs> seriously, if it wasn't for one random night of comp with Omnic Lab folks, I would have never given him a second thought. Um, and honestly, f- for me, it was a similar story. I didn't like Winston at all. I thought that he was a lacking tank. I, I wanted my trusty Reinhardt, and that was it. And then whenever my teammates picked Winston, I was like, oh, great. This, fl- this flimsy tank just got to go jump and die real quick. And it wasn't until I saw some real Winston players that I was like, hold on a second. Winston is awesome. <laughs> and now he's one of my most played tanks, if not my most played. And he was a big ticket for you getting the Masters, if I understand, right? You were playing him and Lucio a lot on your way up there. Yeah, I was playing him, Lucio, and Soldier a lot. Those were kind of like the three that I played. Yeah, I'm going to take a different angle of this. Um, he mentions one random night of comp with the Omnic Lab folks. Um, we had a lot of people even this last game night just talking about um, there, like some guy in our game was just like playing Bastion on King's Row. He's like, is this, are we, are we try harding? I was like, well, we're always try harding. It doesn't mean we don't want to win. <laughs> like if you play Bastion, that's fine. You can play Bastion. <laughs> it's like, this is a safe place. Even though comp should be this way. It's a safe place. But yeah, we, uh, that's something that I really, I really like about the game nights. Cause everybody wants to really try hard, but you know, Sometimes you get in a those light, in a lighthearted you have to play way. tank, and you're not a tank main. So <laughs> you got your friends coaxing you to do it, and not some toxic dudes just being like, "Lol, we have a new Winston." Meh. And they're like trying to tell you to play. It's like, no, dude, you can play Winston. And they're like, "What do I do here?" It, it, it's one of those things where I was like, I, I felt like I really wanted to play Ana. I've missed playing her, and I don't didn't play her until I got in the game night, and I started landing sleep darts on people, and. <clears throat> The satisfaction of landing a sleep dart is yet to be tamed. Like, that is my favorite thing in Overwatch, is landing a good sleep dart. So I, I might be dipping my toes back into playing some Ana for season eight. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, do, yeah, give a little story here, now that you said about try harding okay. in the game night, because I thought yeah. this was really cool. We're in my lobby, and in my lobby we had, like, two Grandmaster players, a master. It was, it was me and then like a couple other people. And some of them were like like platinum, diamonds, uh, and a few golds. Mm-hmm. And we were choosing random captains. And eventually, one of the games, one of the teams ends up super stacked in terms of like the actual ranks. Rank. Yeah. yeah. And then um, some of the people, and in, in, I ended up in that team, and some of the people in my team were kind of like teasing the other team. It's like, oh, man, we're super stacked. You guys better watch out kind of thing. You guys messed up Trash with your talk, picks. Yeah, yeah kind of like giving some, some like, um, a, a little, you know, elbow. Friendly elbow banter. Hit. Yeah, yeah, And then we go into the game, and this is like the traditional story of the hare and the turtle. Tortoise. Yeah, yeah. the tortoise, whatever you want to call it. Um, because my team, they were so confident in themselves that they were like over committing. They were not play. We were not playing like it's playing super a, a, su- a super good comp. Yeah, we we're. It, it was especially that just playing super aggressive and not respecting the enemy. And I mentioned it a couple of times. I was like, "Hey guys, you know, we're playing a little aggressive. You know, I I, I know that <laughs> our, our ranks on paper are higher, but you know." Doesn't mean we guys have to play bad. Right have to watch the VOD for this. <laughs> um, but funny enough, the game is actually super, super even. And the other team ends up winning it at the end. They actually give Dang. us a run for the money and they take it. Because on their side, I, I'm imagining they were like, oh, these guys think that they're so good, huh? We'll, we'll show them. We're gonna show them what we can do. They're and try they, harding from the comp screen. They man. were playing. They like, were playing right, really well. Go. They were playing really well, and it made for a really cool game. And then it was it was lesson learned. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're right. Were they trash talking you after the game lobby? Like, no, nope, hmm, no. Nope, must not, not be that hard to get to GM anymore, huh? Not, uh, not <laughs> at all. Actually, they were very polite after the game. They were just like, "Hey, that good game, funny. good game, guys," and they moved on. And I was like, "Oh man, these guys are great." <laughs> yeah. I will say that even though I'm not like a Masters Diamond player, a, a few times when I was able to win a couple 1v1s playing Zen against Tracers, even if they were at the same rank, it's it's, it's just as rewarding when you realize you're doing something right. And um, even stuff like when you get coaching, 
and then you go you can go like run it in the game night and practice. That's that's always fun too. But I need to read the next one here, or we're not gonna run out of time. <laughs> yeah. Shadow Jesus. I don't I don't want to even know how you came up with that name, but that's cool. Okay, here we go. <laughs> one one. <laughs> one of the biggest things I learned and took away from the podcast is uh from the podcast usual content would be taking away Torb's turret placement and armor pack character prioritization and when to effectively use Zen's right click or Zen's volley ability. I remember the day I listened to the Going Deep Torb episode and I went home after work and used what I learned in comp. And pretty quickly, Torb became one of my highest win percentage heroes that season. While win rate is not the best metric, I think it can be a useful one. Seeing the results of taking the advice from the episode into action that got me into becoming a patron and the Sombra episode really helped me become at least proficient at her when I could never get the hang of her in the first place. And I really wanted to be good at her for quite a long time. I have to agree. Um, I could definitely see after we had certain games, game nights, after uh, we had like going deep episodes, the population of people picking like I don't know, Hanzo and, and Sombra. I, I remember Andres was playing at a game night and they were like, can we just ban Sombra? This is not fun anymore. Because <laughs> he was playing Sombra. It was you don't super, hear that super often. irritating. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the two CP maps, it's, it's really rough. But yeah, like I, I can definitely say that uh, I, I became way more confident playing some of the heroes after going deep episodes, just listening to uh to other people talk about how to play as a as a broadcaster like i'm andres and i we're just you know the players we're, we're not top 500 by any stretch we're always learning <laughs> stuff from these guys it's it's really cool yeah like, it's very it's very true we learn too from the going deeps i learned during the going deep all the time like one of the some oh, of the yeah. players will come up with these little tips and stuff that i've never tried myself i'm like wait seriously you can do that I'm gonna go. Yeah, do that things now. with May on the Jardio episode, like the fact that you can release the the spray of the freeze sooner because it applies in the air was just like mind bending at the moment. I was just like, "What? You can save so much <laughs> ammo that way." Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move to right, the next Andres. one. This one comes from Switch, one of our mods, and also the owner of Un Omnic Meta. He says, "This year, I learned two big lessons. The first lesson was the hardest to learn." when to switch heroes. I realize common pitfall is that mm. players are very hesitant to switch, even when being countered. I almost have my ultimate, let me use it, and then I'll switch, is the phrase I continue to hear over and over. When I rea What I realize is that Overwatch is a game where time is incredibly precious, and that is usually the right thing to do is switch immediately instead of waiting to charge and use your ultimate. When I switch immediately, I can counter the enemy's composition. I give my team a better chance to win and more time and opportunities to win. As an example, switching from my comfort pick, Soldier 76, to Junkrat enabled, my, enabled many wins where we needed to win the shield battle, battle or quickly capture the point as time expired. That high burst of damage in a short period of time sometimes let me charge Riptide in under a minute, leading to crucial picks needed to win the match. I definitely agree. And I think that the one thing I will highlight about this is that time is precious. Mm. Say that 10 times every time you go into a comp game. Because sometimes I see some people just really taking their time doing things. Um, and this comes down to everything. Sometimes that flanker that took too long to flank, that's very bad. Or the person who took too long to switch, very bad also. The person who decided to not back up after the team was completely dead and then died 10 seconds after everyone had died. Very bad. Like all these little things add up over time. And then you have six people. If more than one person is doing these small little things, at the end of the match, you've probably lost like over a minute or more just from fooling around from time that you could mm -hmm. have used to like fight all that stuff. So time, very precious. Tell that to yourself every time you play. The second major lesson this year is that Overwatch is best played when you focus on your own play and how you can enable your team to win. Your teammates' play is out of control, and one and while you can make calls and directly direct strategy in the match, in the end you will have to accept however they play. Wasting precious brain cycles, worrying or getting tilted from teammates' play or lack of thereof is not helpful. 
Use those brain cycles to focus on your own gameplay to win more games. Examples that come to mind are accepting stubborn one tricks and stubborn five DPS comps, etc. In the end of the day, play your best to support your team. You give yourself the best chance to win, and if you do lose, there's always the next match. And we talk about this all the time over here. I hope Every that this show. I hope that this <laughs> mentality spreads out a little more. Honestly, the the more of this mentality that we can have on the ladder, I know that a lot of pros are kind of like embracing this. I've seen a lot of tweets from the pros kind of like calling a call to action to be more positive, to be more influential um, in a positive way in the game. And it's it's um how, what I'm, what is the word I'm looking for? Contagious. It's contagious is what I'm looking for. If you go into a match and you find that guy that is really just working for a team, is making the right call outs, he's being friendly, he's like he's an enjoyable person to play with, he's doing his job, he's trying to play for the team, you immediately notice that. It's just so notice- noticeable in the games and those games are so enjoyable and you want to be nicer to those people in return because, you know, it, they're mm-hmm. enjoyable to play with. So it's just natural human reaction. And the more we have that, the more enjoyable is going to, is going to be play, I guess. Don't worry so much about being right. Just play the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do You don't need to be right. Like at the end of the day, you don't need to be right. Just, just play. Can't change the situation. Just play it. All right, and Stappa087 says, I learned one of the most important things for a tank is to peel for healers. Controversially, I also learned the importance of recognizing how each support ought to be positioned and that they cannot all hold the same position during team fights. This guy sounds exactly like what I've been learning this year. <laughs> uh, but yeah, peeling, peeling. What is peeling? Peeling is basically pulling enemies off of your allies by virtue of being the protector that's that's peeling or creating space between you and another person on your team is peeling for them that's the term peeling basically for that are basically putting pressure or on any attacker that is trying to kill your supports for example generally supports yeah, yeah. you can peel for other people but usually it's the supports that are getting bullied yeah yeah, yeah. and this is this is super important it's um symbiotic relationship right like just how you expect mm. your healer to follow you into battle and keep you alive through all that spam damage that is coming at you yep your healer also expects you to you know pay attention to him when he's getting harassed and the at the lower ranks i see this happening a lot you'll have like a genji or somebody hitting the healer and nobody will ever turn around and sometimes is as simple as just if you're a soldier or if you're Winston, or even if you're the other healer, just turning around and shooting some bullets at the person, um, maybe throwing a shield on your healer, maybe if you're the other healer, give him a heal, um, mm-hmm. and just washing out after them, because the more that you can do this, the more resilient your composition is going to be. All right, next one. Next one comes from Rainer Wilkie. I learned that getting better at Overwatch needs to be a conscious choice paired with defined goals and positive attitude. Thank you guys for the podcast. It has been the bridge to my gameplay from just a fun game to something I felt could really, I could really work on and see improvements and satisfaction. Thanks for being dedicated and taking this podcast seriously. I'm excited for the new year and I hope to be able to participate in the community more. Thanks again and happy holidays. Happy holidays to you too, my man. Um, that is really, really awesome. I think that there's been like a common theme. A lot of people here are all about that like positive attitude. And I mm. also like that a lot of people are realizing that Overwatch at the end is a game of training your skill. Like Overwatch doesn't have and any it's progression. That's the enjoyment. Yeah, that is the game. There's no progression. There's no campaign. There's no story mode. There's there's nothing like that. You don't level your heroes. Um, you're not unlocking things with them aside from like a few cosmetic sprays and skins. Yeah. Um, the game itself is how can you take this four ability hero and make yourself better and better with that every day? And the people who are playing at the top level of Overwatch are playing with the same hero and four abilities that the people at the bottom of the ladder. But they have just figured out better ways to use that hero. And the the coolest thing about Overwatch is that it's 
almost infinite. It takes time for it to develop, but I'm pretty sure that you can you can keep pushing the skill bar more and more and more by slower increments, but it's something that's going to go on for decades probably, or I hope. I mean, every patch, the game changes. Every hero, the game changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to keep evolving. as. And even the same heroes, even the same heroes, people just learn more and more little tricks, more little nuances they can exploit in every map, more little things that nobody expected before kind of thing. Yeah. All right, let's read the next one here and the last one before we get into the host tips before we close the show of 2017 comes from L. Chris L. I learned that you don't need to have a meta comp to win as long as you're staying positive. Positioning can also be more important than your individual player's skill. And finally, play what you're good at. I don't have to be a flex to make a comp to make the comp work every time. Sometimes it does more good than bad. (laughs) <laughs> um, I think he means it does more bad than good, but yeah, <laughs> I agree. Um, this is definitely something I learned when I had one game two seasons ago, and I mentioned it on the show. I'm playing Zenyatta, and I lock it in because I'm like, this is my best hero right now. I have the highest win percentage, and I had just played two games prior, and I won both of them playing this hero. And I'm in a role, and my brain is set to play Zenyatta, so I'm going to play Zenyatta. And my team locks in five DPS and not one of and that none. We don't have a Sombra. We don't have a tank. We don't have anything to peel for a Zen. And I'm like, guys, I'm going to try to keep you up. If you need healing, come to the cart. Cause we're playing, you know, route 66. And let me tell you, these guys fragged out so hard. We won the game because they just literally continually trickled or we got double kills to start every fight that we didn't have to worry about healing because <laughs> um, discord just let us rip through tanks. We had a reaper and a Genji and a soldier. So we were able to benefit from self sustainability in some ways, but it was just bananas how fast these guys were fragging. And like many people say, screw the meta, play the game and win games. We've kind of breaking that record a lot. It seems like with a lot of you guys. So it's a good way to finish here. Let's transition to you, Andres. What are some things you learned this season? One or two things that are your big takeaways from maybe not this season, but this year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I've learned this season, I've always been a very flexible player. I think that my hero pool is fairly, fairly good. I can play a, a wide variety of heroes. But one thing that I've really noticed, though, is that at a platinum diamond level, I can play probably like most of the roster. No problem. Um, but if I really want to play at my highest level, there are a few heroes that are, are up there more than uh, some other heroes. And I can immediately tell, um, when I'm playing the game and i see, I see some people sometimes do this too. And I've noticed it in myself too, um, that when you're trying to be flexible for your team, sometimes you'll be like, Hey guys, I can play anything. Just, you know, pick I'll fill. And sometimes that, that, is, that is true, but sometimes it's more useful if you actually narrow it down for your team and for yourself. Just be like, you know what? I'm good at Winston, Lucio, and Soldier kind of thing. Those are my like the guys that I know I'm performing at my top level right now. I can play Tracer. I can play McCree. I can play Little Widow. I can play some Farah. I can play Diva. I can play all these things, but... At the end of the day, I know that I'm going to give my best performance on those three usually. It can be more than three. I don't know. But honestly, there's always like a a, a small amount. It's always like two or three that you're your best. Sometimes people are really good at just one and okay at the rest. So honestly, be be honest with yourself um, and don't be like, like that person that when they ask you, hey, man, what do you listen to? You're like, oh, everything. It's like, do you really listen I mean to every, every hero? Do you really listen to everything? It's like, be more specific. Like when I ask you, what do you listen? I want to hear you tell me, oh man, I like rock and electronic. These specific bands are my top three. And I'm like, okay, awesome. I can I can see your style. I, it gives me an, an, a mm. good like measurement of who you are um music wise and the same is in overwatch if you just tell me oh i'm good i'm good at everything i can just play whatever 
but you are not really good at everything, then there there can be a discrepancy there. And um, the second thing I was going to say that I've learned from uh, the community is play with other people in your team like they know. Game nights are really good for this, but play in a six stack. It's such a different world of Overwatch, especially if you can find other six people that want to play seriously. And when I say seriously, it's not like super tryharding, yelling at each other and being mad if you lose. But when I say seriously, it's like you're going into the game and you want to work together. You're willing to try out compositions, even if they fail. The funnest thing about playing with six people that are willing to work together is that you can try out strategies that you can't do it anywhere else. Um, and the game night is super good for this, especially because a lot of people are super into trying the whole strategies and stuff. Um, and sometimes when I'm in the games with them, I guess being the podcast host, they, t they tend to listen to me. I'm like, hey, guys, let's do this. And most people are like, <laughs> OK, yeah, sure. You, you know, you, you probably know what you're doing. Um, so it's been it's been pretty nice. But if you can find a group of people to do this, it's so much fun. And it's a different game. When all your team is like working on these little cool strategies, you can pull up like a protect the president or you can do like a dive comp or you can even get like really creative and do like, you know what? What if we do like a triple tank junk rat and just like phase dive him? They might not be expecting that. Um, and it, it becomes a mind game as well, right? Because if you're playing against another six stack, then you might know what they're going to come up with. So you're like, ooh, let's come up with this and instead beat him. And everyone's kind of like on the same page. I don't know. It's really fun. It's a different way to experience it in the game. If you need a place to start, the game nights are great. But try to find a regular group that you play with. Honestly, it's it's a different game. All right. You guys know that I'm bad at being verbose. So I'm going to try to narrow it down. And I wrote everything down in dictation so that I keep with my my points here and not bore you guys to death um but here here's uh my my three things one with the most complicated to the most broad so the first one is know what every hero does optimally with their whole kit because that is important for everyone not just the person and not just the hero that you're playing for example i've been playing zen this last season and there are many times that i need to realize that my impact is actually not helping my team progress and purely based on the enemy team's composition you realize that i'm not doing anything with this team uh, beyond providing discord and killing things um, because my ultimate doesn't do anything and the example here is when the enemy team has like a winston and a diva along with dps of a tracer and a junk rat or and their supports are re relatively irrelevant which would be you know mercy lucio in this in this instance my ultimate for transcendence now has zero value because the enemy team has pure damage ultimates that happen in a moment in time at a burst and are instantaneous in how they kill things. So in those situations, my ultimate transcendence does nothing to counter them because they can still kill you through transcendence. And the only reason to use transcendence is for survival. Um, so in that sense, I should ask my team what we need to do in that situation and see what else to change to. I can switch to another DPS or a tank to give us some more mobility or pressure. I can ask for this that solo heal or I can switch to Ana and help our DPS frag out a little bit faster and harder and make us more durable. Or I can, you know, if maybe we have more tanks and it makes our, our main healer's job a little bit easier if I play Ana. Or Maybe we want to get that little bit more mobility and the map dictates that. Um, also needing some more space for Lucio um, with the boop and the sound barrier. So these are situations that I found myself in more complicated uh, situations of realizing your kit is doing nothing based off of the enemy team's composition and what their kits actually just do. Um, you can find value in most of your kit, but a lot of times the how the ultimates match up doesn't really work if the teams are going even. If you're if you're in a winning situation, you don't need to switch, just stay. But if you're in a going at 50/50 or a, a, there's a position where you can definitely lose, that's not the the thing to do is not, is uh, staying on that hero that's not giving you any value. Second thing I learned out of 3 is don't use or do 
anything without visual or auditory cues on what's going on. <laughs> Do not burn your Zen ultimates or your Mercy Valkyries in order to speed to the point or whatever is going on without seeing something or hearing something first with your own character or your team. Aside from positioning in Overwatch, vision and mobility are the well, I guess vision auditory cues and mobility are the two other aspects that perfect the triforce of things to push players into the realm of mastery. And I have by no means arrived, but I'm just saying do not blow your ultimates on big long or your other big long cooldowns without visual or auditory information that can be seen and understood. This carries over into low skill tiers when people are hearing an ultimate being used and then you feel like you're in the fight where you hear another six ultimates go off before the two teams finish fighting and you're either winning or losing. It's really bad when you hear these ultimates go off and um, you realize you just needed that one ultimate from Soldier to flip the fight. That's if Soldier true. kills two people with a, a attack visor, you don't need to blow your ultimate. Um, that's not the situation. You need to understand what your ultimate does and then operate it in such. And if you're stacking ultimates for no reason, there's you could honestly be losing the game before you realize it by virtue of just not having something available to you in your toolkit. Absolutely. To, to piggyback on that a little bit, because I think this is very important what you said about not blowing ults without having visual or auditory cues. Um, the, the visual and auditory cues can come from from many places, but the one thing that you need to get really good at is once you hear them or see them, learn to recognize what stage of the battle are you in um, or what's like the situation. Like learn to assess the situation of your team and the enemy team without necessarily having to be there. And you, you can use it using the, um, the kill feed. You can use it just pressing tab and literally looking to see if there's any any of your teammates dead, if any of them have ultimates. You can look to see if any of the enemy team is dead. Um, you can also use your own sense of timing to kind of try to predict what enemy ults they might have. You can try to look and see how the fight went uh, did the enemy team kill a lot of people? Was it a very particular person that killed all those people? Because if you can like dissect all this information, you can kind of tell where you are. You can kind of tell, okay, the enemy team has this many ults, probably. Um, two of my teammates are dead. There's only three people on point. And if you assess all that situation, you can tell yourself, okay, this is a losing battle. Enemy team is coming with four ultimates. We have three people on point. Two people just died. There's just no way we're going to be able to take this. Should we back out all the way and wait for the last second to see if the other two guys are close enough that we can actually do a last minute push? Or should we just kind of abandon it and move on to the next one, yeah. not give him any more ultimates, or even even try to bait out one of their ultimates or two of their ultimates and then get the hell away from there. You know what I mean? It's just like assessing it's all this information. It's effectively learning the macro game, guys. Like yeah. The micro game is learning the heroes and how the abilities and doing mechanics and sensitivity. That's like the micro, like learning little things that you need to be learning. The macro game is knowing what's going on at all times. Exactly. Like ult economy, we talk about a lot. Economy of the game is the macro game like who died what did they die to um like just looking at the kill feed and knowing that somebody on your team died is super important but now you can know if somebody died using the scatter arrow of that hanzo on the enemy team you guys know you can push into him if he's only getting kills with scatter but you know the guy's not hitting a lot of his shots you can go kill him you know if somebody died to an ultimate or not so use that information um and remember the economy of the game is who uses, or the way people win the game is how the economy of ultimates being used uh, are not just being used and killing things, but how they're being used in an efficient manner to provide value around the objective. Not who gets more kills, who hits Q less, and who gets play of the game. The economy of ultimates regards around how you're providing value and how you're regarding the point. 
And if you can do that using less ultimates, generally you can win because you have more tools at your disposal to use them. Mm -hmm. And also, like Andre said, assessing the situation, you can use all of your ultimates when it's getting to be at the very end of the game and it's an overtime. And if you blow six ultimates at once, you can finish the game because that means that you're just going to win sometimes. <laughs> so you got to keep that in mind. Ideally. Well. All right. The last thing, last thing that puts the big kibosh on everything. I thought this was a good summary for what I learned with a lot of the stuff that I was reading when I was putting the show notes together, which was don't stagnate, which means you should never stop learning. The games where you're not seeing your own mistakes in your own games are the games you should review. Those are the ones that you can find things th to improve with someone else that is either better than you or someone even at the same skill bracket just with different eyes to help you find those mistakes or things to improve on. When you start blaming teammates, when you get upset at being unlucky in your ranked games or during the scope of the season, when you have games where you think you're losing due to key enemies, going unchecked or having situations go awry that are not your responsibility are all key indications that you've stopped concerning yourself with how you play the game. Changing how you play the game is the only way to garner results. As the age old proverb goes, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Um, that is couldn't very say true. it any any better than the the age old proverb that uh, I researched to see if it was actually Einstein's quote or not, but just happened to make its way into one of his books and isn't necessarily attributed to him. <laughs> but that's a brief sidebar. But yeah, like you guys, the reason I listed these so explicitly in the examples was because these are all things that I found myself doing. Um, I blame my teammates. I do this with. Um, saying well we just lost that game because things were unlucky or we lost that fight because that guy fragged out a little bit more than we did while those statements could in essence be true or false is moot point the point is what could you have done differently in order to offset that as best you could maybe you did do what you could maybe sometimes there's there are situations where you're like i shouldn't have done that and then you have somebody else get into your games like andres or you get somebody like a, a coach somewhere else and they look at your vibe you're like i think you made the right call here and this is the real reason why um even if you didn't do something intentionally i had something like that happen in a vod review i'm playing zenyatta and i'm matched up against a reinhardt and i happened to jump at the same time that he hammer smashed me with just like or not hammer smash but uses melee and what i didn't know he says i'm pretty sure you didn't do this on purpose but this is a good time to talk about it is a highly advanced tool. If Reinhardt is swinging his hammer and you jump at the moment he hits you, he will Pushes actually have a little bit further of the knockback so you can actually escape and, and peel for yourself in yeah. that situation by doing a highly advanced tactic. And that's something I would have never learned had I not done something even accidentally and somebody else viewing my VOD from out. a higher point of view could point it out. Mm -hmm. So those are things that are just really, really valuable. Um, just coming from a set of eyes or some a set of eyes that is better than you. Um, it can always happen. But that is it, guys. That is all the tips we have for you, all the tips we got from you. And um, thank you guys for being patient with us rolling out this episode a little later um, because we wanted to make sure we had as much submissions as we could. And game night went a little long for some of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little so. too long, yeah. <laughs> We're going to close out the show here in the next 10 minutes. Um, we wanted to make sure we addressed some of the feedback we got on iTunes, so let's do that now. We got three iTunes reviews this week. Special thanks to SmartyPants17, GOC, uh, Sparky, and Sparky Cascada from Canada for your iTunes reviews. We deeply appreciate them. And Andres wanted to read one of them in particular that was a non-five-star review so that we could address some of your direct feedback here. So Andres, take us away. Yeah, yeah. I think this is very fair feedback, and it's actually something that I've been thinking about myself. We don't have a particular like decision or solution right now, but I did want to open this up for discussion because I think you make a good point, Smarty Pants. I think you guys should do such a great job finding relevant strategy to talk about and getting in touch with some of the best players to discuss specific heroes. I've learned a ton from your podcast and it's made me and my brother and my brothers way better at the game. All of us agree though that the show would benefit from splitting the podcast into a news portion and a strategy podcast, effectively publishing two episodes per week. We found that this podcast late in the game and the news portion is irrelevant for us as it makes scanning through every episode for strategy kind of annoying. We love you guys and your podcast, but next level would be cleaning this up. Thank you for all you do. 
Thanks for the review, Smarty Pants. And this is something that I, I'm interested in asking more members of the community because we do find some value in the news. I think that some people like listening to the news and they like, you know, getting their their share of news while they're in their commute and also kind of like a little bit of opinion with them. Um, maybe some, how they're going to influence strategy. But I do agree that there's a lot of you here that are mostly interested in the strategy part of the podcast. And you get your news from Reddit, from the Bottle.net launcher, from forums, or whatever it is they get it. The, the news are not hard to get. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to open the discussion. Email us. Talk to us on Discord. Um, we might make like a couple things on Discord where you can directly engage with us about this. But we've been thinking about solutions to this. Making two podcasts a week is a little on the hard side for us at this moment just because of scheduling. Uh, we also have jobs that we have to do. This is not like our full-time job that we do. And putting together an episode takes a little more than just Rob and me jumping into uh, mm -hmm. Discord and talking to each other. Um, especially because, you know, we got to plan it, we got to edit it, we got to publish it. All of this takes time and effort. And <clears throat> it's not something that we are opposed to doing. It's just something that we need to find a good balance so that you guys get a good product and we can also consistently pull it off without banging our heads on the desks and or girlfriends and wives leaving us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we just wanted to give you guys a little bit more feedback from the creator's point of view. We realize this is like something from a pure consumption level. It's just like, this makes total sense. Why aren't you doing this? But it's similar in a lot of the things that you're like, if you don't understand how the production goes or you don't understand, you know, some of the back end work, even with the game of Overwatch, you're like, why wouldn't you just fix this? It seems so easy. It's generally not. <laughs> um, and with us, it's it's uh, it's pretty tough. And we we started doing this a little bit later on in the game where we would omit on some of the going deeps and we also put the news at the end of the show so you could just get the interview get the show and if you're in the archives you don't have to worry about the things that are relevant there but the other catch 22 that's really great about doing news with a special guest is getting a pro opinion on current events is also super valuable and so we try to get that in there as best as we can um, so just give you a little bit of pushback there. We do like the idea and we will take more feedback from the community. We'd love to hear more on that. Um, yeah, but thank you again for your iTunes review. We really appreciate it. And the feedback as well is great. And if you guys have already left an iTunes review, you can go um, send us your feedback via email or our podcast questions channel in the Discord. Or you can DM us on Discord too. Our DMs are open. Um, the last little bit here about iTunes is it is the best free way to support the show beyond listening. Listening is great. It gets us to pad those stats and get people noticing that there are more people downloading the show is great. And also, um, it is just phenomenal with helping other people find the show. Um, it pushes us up in the ratings. So if people search Overwatch, they can find us easier. And um, just last little bit on this, we had somebody in the chat, Drunken Monk, asking about just putting a timestamp on the notes when the transition switches. That is a great thing to do, and it also, yet again, requires some more work on the back end. Instead of just simply posting the show, we can expedite the process of getting the show from us to you and also off the editing table in a very, very fast way if we don't provide timestamps. It adds a lot more work to us that way, and um, if that's something you want to su submit to us, that's great. Um, that's not but a, again, it's not, not something that we're behind. It's it not be, a terrible idea. It's it something be, it that we want to like get more feedback on. Yeah, yeah, we right now, like I said, we've been talking about this because I, I think I've mentioned it to Rob before, because mm -hmm. I do, I do find a little conflict of interest between the news and the strategy portion, and maybe different people are interested in different, different aspects of the discussion there. Um, so yeah. we're gonna be looking into that and try to come up with a solution sure. that is good for everyone. And we also want to hear from, from others of you. Is this a problem for you guys or do you guys like it the way it, the way it is? Um, like I said, I've been talking about it and since I saw the review, I was like, oh, our listeners kind of, some of them might be in the same train of thought as mm, that. Right. So that's why we're bringing it up. Um, but yeah, yep. let's close out the show. Thanks again to all of our patrons. Special thanks to especially the Diamond patrons who support us every month at the highest level. Chris the Playa, Ginger Sasquatch, Good Apollo, Great Root Bear, Lysum, Magic, 
Matt R, Not Muadib, Never Clutch, Ricky Dicky, Sketchy Nonsense Podcast, Top Score Solutions, and Tragic Zach. We also have a new patron this week, Kip. He's another Diamond patron. Thank you so much, man. You are awesome. I had the pleasure of playing with Kip, and this dude frags. Like, he is the real deal. He was in my lobby all night, and it was so fun to watch him play Reaper. He carried us a couple times getting triple kills with them Death Blossoms. It was nutty. Nice. So it was really cool to have him in there. Um, just a quick note, again, Andres on PayPal, or not PayPal, Patreon. This is this is basically how we get to BlizzCon from now on is kind of what we've transitioned this to become. Um it's really, really expensive. I finally has got a little bit more realization of how much I had to spend to get there, and it was a little more than I was expecting. And um, yeah, we're, we're we're still trying to budget it in, but if you guys can help me out in particular to get me to BlizzCon and get us like recognition for media passes, it certainly helps. Um, but I just want to let you guys know, BlizzCon hurts if you're trying to travel internationally beyond like South America, North America areas. I'm sure uh, a lot of you it's know. It's real tough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, some of our Aussie friends could really relate with that. So I just wanted to let you guys know that it was really difficult, still continues to be. And um, we just want more people part of the community. If you guys want to donate to the show, patreon.com slash OmniClab is the best way to do it. Um, there are some pu some perks there, some goals for us. You can read up on it there on the on that site. If you want to find the show, head over to the website, omniclab.com slash links. You can find everything you need to know how to engage with the Discord, omniclab.me. Andres has got like a little bumper that he can play that I had my wife record, probably play it at the end of the show. And uh, you can find us there. Uh, we also have merch. You can get hoodies. You can get t-shirts. You can get coffee mugs. Check it out on the website. That's it for the show. Andres, where can people find you? If you want to personally find me, you can look me up on Twitter at iPlayGames. You spell that I-P-L-A-I Games. And you can also find me doing the Owl Recap, our new show covering everything from the Overwatch League. You can follow it at the Owl Recap on Twitter. And um, yeah, go check us out. You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram with the tag not Rob. I posted some things about my trip on to Hiroshima this week. I had the pleasure of going to the Peace Park Museum of where the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in World War II. It was very, very cool uh, stuff there if you guys want to go check it out. Pretty sombering, but also very, very moving. Um, there's also a Hearthstone podcast I put together called Velen's Chosen. We talk about decks, and we had a really, really cool special guest I just posted before we, we recorded this live um omnic lab so you can check that out on the feed at velvetchosen.com and i should be guesting on about two different podcasts this week so watch point and blevins is working really hard to get me on their new um it's like esports roundtable similar to recap but a little bit more verbose it's kind of like the oh it's called around the payload i think something like that so yeah I'm I'm still learning on what we're going to be doing for that, as you can probably tell with how I'm describing it. So uh, hopefully I won't sound as foolish when I get on that show, but you guys can go check those things out. Um, yeah, we'll see you guys next week, and Happy New Year. It's actually oh, it's actually 2018 here in Japan. So oh, really? Oh, Happy guys... New Year to you. Yeah, well, thanks. We started a little bit around that time. It's 125, but yeah, you guys have a great New Year, and good luck in Season 8. I'll be right alongside you, hoping to grind out some more games and hitting those sleep darts. We'll see you guys next week. Remember, don't be a lab rat, be a scientist. As always, thank you to everyone who's up by the chat. You guys are super awesome. Sorry, sorry we can't interact with you guys too much on the show, but then it would make for a lot of editing later. <laughs> I wish we could uh, interact with you guys a little more. Dragon Monk, thanks for stopping by. I have nothing more to teach.